may speak in the name of one, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated, dear friends. Oh, yes, Lord, we are here. Yes. like the disciples, have I remained silent before God, afraid to ask the hard questions. Perhaps like them, I feel that being close to Jesus means, especially because I went to seminary, we should have, I should have all the answers by now, right? Perhaps we fear that if we ask our questions, and especially if you have done any critical uh, graduate work and deep thinking about anything in life, or maybe you're just pursuing knowledge and wisdom, uh, perhaps we fear that if we ask a question, I will appear uninformed, I will appear weak, I will appear unworthy. So, so does this passage invite you, me, us, into something deeper, perhaps an honest, vulnerable relationship with Jesus where we are encouraged afresh and new again, because it happens every Sunday, right? Jesus keeps inviting us, bring me the confusion, bring me the doubts, Test if my love and grace is enough, big enough to hold your questions, Lester. And in the reading, Jesus shares something I think that's both uh, shocking and deeply troubling to, to me, to the disciples. Again, can you imagine, you know, a, a coffee hour? And our Lord is saying, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be killed, and in response, after all of that that we've heard, <laughs> uh, what were you arguing about? <laughs> were you arguing about the suffering that's going to happen in my life? Were you arguing about the sacrifice? Were you arguing about the, the, the miracles that I performed and broke the, the rules of nature? No! What was those Episcopalians arguing about who is the greatest? <laughs> the only thing I could figure out this time to argue about was how unique and great I am amongst my peers, my fellow clergy, my fellow Episcopalians, I dare say even my fellow Lagunatics in this Laguna Beach. So how often do I really do that? How often do I deflect from the hard, painful truths of life? Truths of service, of sacrifice, of suffering, by focusing on my own importance, maybe my own desire for greatness. 
Now the disciples wanted to know who was the greatest, but Jesus, in his wonderful wisdom, reframes the entire question. And this is what's hard for me. He didn't offer a definition of greatness based on power, success, or status, even though I really wanted him to. Instead, he points to humility and service. What does verse 35 say? Whoever wants to be the first must be last of all and servant of all. That is a strange thing to hear today, I think. In a time where, where the world tells me, you know, my greatness is defined by how much I have, how successful I have, how much influence I wield. And then Jesus says, true greatness is found in servitude. It is found in humility. It is found in a willingness to take the lowest place, to put others first, to love in a way that seeks nothing in return. No human being can live that way. Can they? So this is a difficult teaching, and it's not a new one. I think, oh, at least you've journeyed with us at St. Mary's or any. If you've, but, if you've bitten into any scripture and you know anything about Jesus of Nazareth, this is not a new question. This is not a new invitation, right? But I, I'm grateful because it asks afresh, and it helps me to look at it afresh. Uh, and what a, what a gift to have even just grown up the way I did in, in, in the Church of the Province of Southern Africa then. And many of you know, I mean, just this wonderful priest, Desmond, who talks about um, leadership, and he famously spoke about the power of humility as the path to greatness. And he really lived it out, at least what I saw. Right? This, this embodiment of Ubuntu, this I am because we are, it reminds me, it reminds us that true greatness is found not in the elevation of self, but in the elevation of the community. Our humanity is bound up in the humanity of one another. And so what does it mean for me, for us, to live in a, in a way that our greatness, my greatness, is tied to the well-being of my neighbor, of my community? And, he, and I think Tutu shows us that the measure of greatness is not how high we can climb, but in how deeply we can serve. And then I have this, 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 this wonderful uh, writer, uh, Mercy Amba Ojuyoya, uh, a wonderful leading African female theologian who, who, who really advocates for the marginalized, particularly the poor and, and women. And so she speaks about the invisible in society and how the invisible bear the brunt of suffering in many communities. And so, what an interesting invitation afresh to the church um, where we are called to be with and stand with. What we do here, outreach, we stand with and uplift those who are often overlooked. So, so in, in the gospel today, in my life, in our lives today, friends, at least this week, where do I find myself in the pecking order of life? Am I seeking greatness at the expense of others? Am I seeking to bring out the best in others, especially the least amongst these? How am I standing with those who are the most vulnerable, uh, even though it might be my, my actual job as an ordained priest to do that? But how am I really doing it? I'm not just doing it for so that Tyler can give me another like on Facebook, I see you saying that. And then Jesus takes the child and places the child among the disciples as an example. As we know in ancient times, children were the least powerful members, at least we can feel in ancient times, children should be seen and not heard. So what does it mean to welcome the powerless? Or at least better yet, how can I embody this humility in my life? Which is hard because it means, or at least doesn't mean 
turning away from that pursuit of personal great, personal greatness instead of embracing uh, and instead embrace the way of of love of servant and don't get me wrong I, I I know we've said it out loud, right? Put on your oxygen mask before you help others. But do I forget to help others to put their oxygen mask because I'm so busy putting on mine? What does it mean? And so like the disciples, I, I wonder, do I fail? Do we often fail to really then understand this calling? Do I get caught up in my arguments about who is right? Or, or who is more important, or who is the greatest, and trust me, get a couple of theologians together, whoo, you will have some philosophical arguments about rightness, strife for recognition, for influence, for success. But again, how do we hold it in balance, right, maybe, in holy tension? What does it look like in my life today? We are reminded that true greatness lies in the ability to serve, to love, and to uplift another. And so, Jesus is called towards greatness doesn't look like the world's definition. And so how do I live in that tension? Because like any good person, I think that has an amazing credit score, because I do, I know that my, my goal for success, hey man, if I get that secret Amex black card invitation, woo, I've arrived, and I, if you have one of those, I'm really not quoting, I really, this is just me giving my own, I'm sharing with you. Success in my own life. Again, I come from a time when I think the sunken lounge and the, the leather couch was like you've arrived. <laughs> right? Again, I'm just asking, I'm just exploring in the light of Jesus and Nazareth, what does it mean to arrive? When I get gold status of United? <laughs> Woo! 48 hours pre check. I, again, what does it mean? <laughs> True greatness is not found in power or recognition, but in service, in a vulnerability, in ability to serve, to love, and to uplift one another. How wonderful that we are reminded about this afresh in this gospel today, not to beat ourselves over it with how unworthy you are, but to remember afresh, hey, Pay attention. You might miss out on the greatest glory and the greatest freedom you would ever experience. A letting go. A finding your identity, not in your achievements, but in your love for one another. That you are more than that degree on your wall, that you are more than what the neighbors think about. What would that look like? What freedom would that be? What will it take this week for you, for me, for us to live out this kind of greatness? How can we follow the example of Jesus and even those wonderful theologians of becoming lost of all and servant? Of all. And again, if you call to serve, what's on your tray? Is it tit for tat or is it truly servant? I think this is the greatness in which we are called to, to step into. I think this is the greatness of the kingdom of God. And even just recognizing the very carrot that's maybe dangling in front of you, in front of me, that I think. Well, you know, once I get there, because again, right? If I get my invitation to my Amex Black Card, my life will be amazing. Because I'll have lounge access. And because I have that, everything will be good. All my problems will be gone. I'm 
just trying to give an example, a real example that I think through that, yeah, I'm not, it's, it's okay to be comfortable, I know it is. I think it's important to celebrate God's abundance, but at the expense of losing who I truly am, does it define me? Is that all or some of the things that I am? Is that what greatness looks like? Again, just asking the question like the disciples. In what ways do I place my own needs and desires above those of others? Thank you, Jesus, that you would always invite us uh, to, to, to move towards greatness that looks nothing like the world's definition. That you call us to embrace a humility, to serve the least, and to lift up the I am because we are ness of the human family. And thank you that you challenge us. What will it take for us to live out this kind of greatness in St. Mary's, in this diocese, in the neighborhood? For well, this is the greatness which we are called to.